All right, kids, what comes after D? E, well done. Have a gold star. I'm very proud of you. E, <laughs> perhaps appropriately, we have a very elf-centric episode for this one. Uh, lots of elf. In fact, I, apart from the last one, they're all very elf-themed. Um, so, yes, if you are an elf fan, this is the one for you. Well, maybe not, because some of the stuff... Ooh, a little bit controversial. Anyway, so, we begin with the Evanuris. So, the Evanuris are the ancient elven gods, also known as the Elven Pantheon. They are made up of nine gods and goddesses who are still worshipped by the Dalish, sort of. It's worth noting that the Dalish don't actually know that much about them, or about how the ancient elves used to worship them. They are keeping them alive in name, but I think probably a lot of the traditions that they have around them are quite unique to the Dalish and probably not something that the ancient elves would recognise, but that's fine. That's okay. That's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. The religions and traditions adapt and grow and change um, as time moves on. That's fine. So, the Pantheon are led by Elgonon, the Allfather, and Mithal, the Allmother. Now, here's me jumping in with my real-world history uh comments as I always do or real world mythology in this case I get strong ancient Greek vibes from this pantheon comes from ancient Greek and just sort of means a group of very important people and most of the elven gods seem to have a Greek counterpart or indeed a Roman counterpart a lot of the ancient religions like ancient Greece and ancient Rome they all borrowed from each other you can find the same kind of gods and god goddesses um in those ancient religions religions even much more ancient than the Greeks and the Romans. Like, there were religions that came before them that had the same gods and goddesses and the Greeks and the Romans just kind of borrowed them. But yes, I think it's it's quite obvious that the, uh, the elven gods are very much inspired by the sort of gods of the ancient world, the real ancient world. Um, which I quite like, because I do another bit of Greek mythology, I do. Um, yeah, so Elgonon would be Zeus and Mithal would be Hera if we're giving them Greek counterparts. One thing I can say is that the elves do seem to at least have less of a fascination with incest however as as far as I can tell Elgonon and Mithal are not brother and sister unlike Zeus and Hera. Instead Elgonon was born of the earth and the sun and Mithal was born of the sea. That's very reminiscent of Greek mythology as well. A lot of their gods are just like oh born of the sea. If you want to laugh, look up how Aphrodite was born. Yeah, look it up. I'm not going to tell you the story because YouTube will cancel me. But uh, it's 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 a funny one. If you don't know it, look it up. It's it's good. Um, Aphrodite. Just just Google how was Aphrodite born. It's a good one. Anyway, yes. Together, Elgonon and Mithal had five children, depending on which versions of the legend that you read. But you know, we'll 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 go, we'll get into that in a minute. So together, they had five children. First off, Phalon Din, the god of death and fortune. Important to note that he wasn't always the god of death, because before the creation of the Vale, elves were immortal. Kind of. Although their version of immortality was just, they lived a really long time, and then they went to sleep for a really long time, and quite often they didn't wake up from that sleep. Which... <laughs> I don't know, that sounds like death to me, but what the hell do I know? Um, yeah, but we'll, we'll cover... We'll cover the long sleep properly later in the uh, in the alphabet. Point is that in ancient times, Falondin would guide the elves' souls through the Fade when they entered their long sleep. Now he guides them into the Fade when they die. So his twin brother is Dirthamon, the god of secrets and knowledge. Andruel is the goddess of the hunt, who watches over the animals of the forest. Silice. Silice? I haven't heard that, this one pronounced that often in the games. I think it's Silice, possibly. Is the hearthkeeper, goddess of the home, basically. She's the, the domestic goddess, for want of a better term. And then the last sibling is June, the god of craft, who taught the elves how to build things. Now, once again, we have to deal with Bioware's ingenious ambiguity, because in some versions of the legend, Silice and Adruel are not daughters of Elgonon and Mithal, but rather daughters of the Earth. And in other legends, June is not their son, but rather Selyse's husband. Hey, he might be both, for all we know. That thing I said about the elves not being into incest, I might have been wrong. Um, <laughs> but there are actually legends that say that June created himself. Because he's the god of craft, so he crafted himself, whatever the hell that means. I, like, I, I don't know how that's supposed to work, but apparently that's a thing. Uh, that's not all the gods, however. There is more. Gilanon is the mother of the Haller. Now... There are a lot of different versions of the legend surrounding her in Dragon Age, but the basic gist is she was an elven huntress who Andruel really liked. 
She liked her so much that she turned her into the first Halla and then elevated her to godhood. They were also apparently lovers, which I just, I, I love a good lesbian goddess of the hunt. She's basically just Artemis. You know, Artemis, the virgin goddess. The virgin goddess Artemis with all of her virgin followers. She just had lots of virgin women following her. Yes, virgins. That's what they were. Absolutely. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's what it was. Which I suppose makes Gilanon Atalanta, possibly. I don't know. I don't know whether... I don't know whether Atalanta and Artemis were actually meant to be lovers, but Zeus manages to seduce Atalanta by appearing to her in the form of Artemis. So, <laughs> you know. And then Artemis kicks her out of the cult because she's had sex with a man, which, like, that kind of, that's like, oh, you're not allowed in our club anymore. You had sex with Zeus. And it's like, I mean, he looked like you. He looked like you, Artemis. She was tricked. <laughs> anyway, stop talking about Greek mythology. Jesus Christ. It's Dragon Age you might be talking about. Yes, but like seriously, you can connect up all of these elven gods with like a Greek pound counterpart. So Andruel is like Artemis, uh, Gilanon is like Atalanta, although Atalanta wasn't a god, but still. Elganon is Zeus, Mithal is Hera, Falandin is Hades, Dirthamon is Athena, I would sort of say. Solis is definitely Hestia. Dune is Hephaestus, probably, which leaves us with Fenharel, who I would say is like Hermes, the trickster god. Before we get too deep into Fenharel, however, we need to talk about the Forgotten Ones. So, the Forgotten Ones were another group of elven gods who acted as the mirror to the Evanurists. The Evanurists are all pure and wonderful and lovely and brilliant, and the Forgotten Ones are all dark and evil and nasty. Sort of like the Evanurists are spirits and the Forgotten Ones are demons, kind of. I don't think they really are spirits and demons. I think they're more than that. But that's kind of the, the sort of general kind of gist. You've got the Evanurists are all lovely and wonderful and the Forgotten Ones are all horrible and evil. Now, Fen Harel, or the Dread Wolf, as he is often known, was the only one who could move between both groups as they both believed that he was loyal to them. The interesting thing about Fen Harel... I mean, there's lots of interesting things about Fenrir, but the thing I find particularly interesting about Fenrir when I was reading up on this is that he doesn't seem to have an origin. There's no, oh, he was born of the earth, or the mountains vomited him out, or I don't know, a cave had sex with a tree in Fenrir. There's nothing like that. He's just, he just exists. And most gods, like ancient style gods, have some weird origin story like you know yes they were born of the sea or whatever Fenharel nothing he just kind of he's just there which all in all I think could have been something of a clue about him to be honest <laughs> anyway he's seen by the Dalish as the god of betrayal but that may be a misinterpretation and uh, he's actually the god of rebellion hmm, that's one way of looking at it uh, legend has it that he tricked both the Evanurus and the Forgotten Ones and imprisoned them both in their respective realms, which brought about the thought of the fall of Arlathan and, you know, the uh, destruction of the Elven Kingdoms and all of that kind of stuff. So yes, according to the legend, um, he locked the Evanurus away in the Heavens, which I'm assuming is the Fade, and he locked the Forgotten Ones away in the Abyss, which I don't really know what the Abyss is. Maybe also the Fade, maybe beneath the earth like the darkspawn are meant to have come from the abyss aren't they just gonna lead on to what i'm about to say next because i don't know does it not sound suspiciously like the human old gods we mentioned this in the last episode that the human old gods are the dragons slash arch demons which are now locked away beneath the earth right we don't really know when they were locked away beneath the earth. The Chantry says the Maker locked them away beneath the earth because the humans were worshipping them. I think it's perfectly possible that they were always locked away under there. You know, when they first started talking to humans, they might have been locked away. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, Fenharel locked the elven gods away. The human old gods are locked away. The Darkspawn are trying to get the old gods out. The Darkspawn who came from the Abyss, the old forgotten ones are in the abyss. Like, there's a connection, right? There's a link somewhere. Is it possible that the human old gods are actually the forgotten ones? Now, we don't know many of the names of the forgotten ones because they're forgotten. We do know, I think, about three or four potential forgotten ones, and none of their names match up with the names of the old gods. Um, so that maybe debunks it a little bit, but I don't know. I don't know. The humans might just have had different names for them. I just feel like it's possible. It's possible, right? Anyway... We learn from Solus that the Evanurus were not, in fact, gods, but just very powerful mages who became leaders 
and uh, enslaved the elven people, prompting the dread wolf to lead a rebellion against them, destroying his own people in the process, because he's a fucking self-righteous moron who thinks he knows what's best for everyone, when he obviously fucking doesn't. Not that I'm saying he should have left them enslaved, but I just think you've got to have some fucking ego to kind of think, oh yes, I'm just going to destroy the world in order to save everybody. And then when it didn't work, I'm going to do it again. Anyway, the whole ancient elves being enslaved by their own leaders thing really annoyed a lot of fans, actually. Like, like the very kind of elf-supporting fans, the people who always play as elves and are very pro-elf. It kind of annoyed them that the ancient elves had been enslaved by their own leaders. Honestly, I don't really understand why. Like, of course the ancient elven leaders were corrupt. Leaders are always corrupt. I don't think you get to be in power without being corrupt. The elven leaders aren't the elven people. Like, a lot of people seem to think that it reflected badly on the elves that their leaders had enslaved them. Like, no, it reflects badly on the elven leaders. And there was only nine of them. Right? There's nine of the Evanurists. One of them is Fen Harel, who actually rebelled against the slavers. Mithal also rebelled against the slavers. We'll get to her later in the alphabet. So that leaves us with seven. There were seven ancient elves who were enslaving people. It's not like the entire ancient elven race was pro-slavery. Seven of them enslaved the rest of them. Like, how eh? I mean, come on, if we, were, if we were all judged by our leaders, we'd be in bloody trouble, wouldn't we? Christ almighty! I don't want to be judged by my leaders. Like, how eh? And I mean, it's also worth noting that Tevinta, the very powerful human empire who enslaves people, enslaves just as many humans as it does elves, right? It's not like Tevinta doesn't enslave humans. It's not humans enslave elves. It's Tevinta enslaves everyone. And back in ancient times, it wasn't elves were pro-slavery, it was the elven leaders enslaved the elves, but there wasn't anybody else for them to enslave because humans hadn't turned up yet. Canari hadn't turned up yet. I think dwarves were kicking around under the ground, but you know, maybe they were too much hassle to enslave. Maybe they did enslave dwarves, who knows? Anyway, this was a really hard topic to try and summarise because there's so many layers to it, but you get the general gist. And on one final note, the Dalish call the Evanurus the creators, but they don't actually believe they created the world. Uh, just like the ancient humans didn't believe that the old gods created the world. In fact, as far as I can tell, all the alternate religions to the Chantry leave room in them for the Maker. None of the alternate religions sort of say, oh, there isn't a Maker. They all kind of leave room for this great deity creator who created everything. They just choose not to worship him. So, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I just thought it was an interesting point. Uh, oh, and one final note about the Forgotten Ones. They may be forgotten, but there are still a few elven clans that worship them uh, instead of the Evanurus. Uh, yes, but they're sort of seen as like evil, demonic, kind of like devil worshippers kind of thing by the Dalish. The Dalish do not approve. So uh, yes, but they do exist, the clans who worship the Forgotten Ones. Right, next, Illuvians. This is an Illuvian. An elven artifact from a time long before their empire was lost to human greed. So, Alluvian is elven for seeing mirror. They are a collection of ancient magical mirrors used by the ancient elves in the time before humans set foot in Thedas. So, the magic that controls them is a mystery to modern day Thedasians. Is that what you call people from Thedas? Thedasians? I'm gonna say that's what we call people from Thedas. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, so the mad- the- uh, <laughs> the magic that controls them is a mystery to modern-day Thedasians, being beyond anything that the Circle of Magi, Tevinta, or even the Dalish can comprehend. Morrigan figures it out, though, because she's a- she's a clever little duckling, is Morrigan, but we'll- uh, we'll- uh, we'll get onto her in a minute. So, the ancient elves used the Alluvians to communicate or travel over long distances, hence why they left no roads. Apparently none of them even fancied going for a stroll or anything. Like, I mean, how if I had a magic mirror in my house that could take me anywhere, I would still want to go out for a walk in the woods now and then. And I would want to walk on a path. Anyway, after the fall of Arlathan, the Alluvians were all but forgotten, with many of them being destroyed. Uh, of those few that remained, most were hidden away in far-flung corners and were often locked. Each Alluvian has a key, and that key can be anything, including knowledge or power. Uh, many have tried and failed to unlock the Alluvians over the centuries, but they have remained mostly elusive. I believe uh, the Tevinta Magisters have tried to unlock them, but they never really achieved much. The Dalish have tried to unlock them, they've never really managed it either. However, 
We encounter a few Alluvians throughout the course of the first three games. In the Dalish Elf Origin, in Origins, we encounter a corrupted Alluvian that is tainted with the Blight. Now, hold on a second. You remember what Bianca said about the Blight only being able to infect living things? I don't know if this is a continuity error, or if the Alluvians are alive? I don't know, but we had a mirror that was infected with the Blight, and apparently the Blight can only infect living things. I don't know. Gets weirder though. Gets weirder. So in Dragon Age 2, it is revealed that Meryl, who is from the clan uh, from the Dalish Elf origin, she took a shard of the corrupted Alluvian, right? And tr tried to rebuild the mirror from it, right? Now, in the course of this pet project, she uses blood magic to cleanse the mirror of the taint. Think about that for a second. The taint, the incurable taint that can only be cured by becoming a Grey Warden. She cleansed the taint with blood magic. So it's not incurable. It can be cleansed with blood magic. Now, I don't know if it can be cleansed from a person with blood magic, but it can be cleansed from a mirror with blood magic. That's the only kind of hint that we get that uh, the, taint, the taint can be cured with blood magic. I mean, I suppose the, the Grey Warden joining ritual is in some ways kind of blood magic, sort of. But yeah, and then like you remember Magister Alexius and his son Felix who was inflected with the taint and him and Dorian spent two years trying to find a cure. Apparently blood magic might have done it. Like Tevinta Magisters aren't that against blood magic, so... But I don't know why he didn't just make Felix a Grey Warden. Like, I think he would have probably had the influence to get, like, the joining ritual. To, you know, do the joining on Felix, but then not actually make him have to go and join the Wardens. So he would be saved, kind of. He'd be able to hear the Darkspawn forever, but then he wouldn't actually have to become a Grey Warden, like, proper. I think he would have the influence to do that, but apparently no. Anyway, we're getting so far off topic here. Uh, yes, the Alluvians play a big role in the book The Masked Empire, where a Dalish clan summons the demon Imshale, more on him later in the alphabet, and his counterparts, um, to help them reactivate an Alluvian. He gives Empress Selene a keystone that allows her to reactivate any Alluvian that she likes. She uses it to transverse a series of elven ruins, and this is where we first encounter what Morrigan calls the Crossroads. So the Crossroads is a sort of world between worlds, not quite the Fade and not quite the Waking world. This is where all of the Alluvians join. So you step through an Alluvian, you end up in the Crossroads, and then you pick whichever Alluvian you need to get where you're going, right? Now what's particularly interesting about the Crossroads is that elves see it as colourful and bright, while everybody else sees it as sort of grey and dark. Elves quite like the crossroads, they can travel quite quickly and easily through the crossroads, while non-elves feel quite sick and fatigued, they can't really focus properly, they can't kind of, you know, they're all, they, they just can't move through it very well. There's a scene in the Masked Empire where they're all kind of traversing through the crossroads, and the elves are all like way ahead and the humans are lagging behind because the humans are finding it really difficult to just kind of focus in the crossroads. And uh, yes, a fabulous attention to detail in the games is that when you enter the crossroads in Inquisition, it genuinely does look different if you're playing as an elf versus any other race. And in the Trespasser DLC, if you take Sarah into the crossroads with you, she will comment on how pretty and colourful it is, while everybody else is like, what are you talking about? It just looks grey. Um, so yeah, it's a nice little attention to detail, I like that. Anyway, back to the Masked Empire. Selene was eventually betrayed by Briala, her lover who stole the keystone from her and used it to reactivate the entire Alluvian network, which she used for her underground army of elves. The Canari also gain access to the network during the Trespasser DLC, where they use it to stage an invasion of the south. But by the end of Trespasser, Solus appears to have complete control of the whole network. Now this brings us to Morrigan. So Morrigan has her own Alluvian that she finds during the Witch Hunt DLC for Origins. Uh, you also use a fragment of the tainted alluvian from the Dalish Origin um, quest in a scrying ritual to find the alluvian. So yes, those are like the two main alluvians in the game that we know about. The one that Meryl's trying to rebuild that was tainted by the blight and then the one that Morrigan finds. By Inquisition, Morrigan still has possession of the alluvian and if Kieran exists in that particular world state, she reveals that she raised him in the crossroads where no one could find her. So she had the crossroads completely to herself, right? To raise Kieran in. 
This suggests that the network has been more or less dormant until quite recently. Like there weren't sort of people secretly running around in the crossroads who had stumbled across the Alluvians or anything like that. Like the, the network was dormant and then quite recently lots of people have woken it up. Like Briala knew about it, the Canari knew about it, and now Solus has control of it. It, it, it seems that, uh, yes, it was Imshale's keystone that kind of woke it all up. That's Imshale, who you uh, encounter in Dragon Age Inquisition. And yes, he will have his own entry in the A to Z because uh, he's quite interesting. Right, next up, the Exalted Marches, particularly the Exalted March against the Elves, since this is our Elven episode. There's a lot I could say about the Exalted Marches in general, but we are going to focus mainly on the Exalted March against the Elves, but I'll give you a brief overview of the Exalted Marches generally. So much like the Crusades of old, the Exalted Marches are holy wars waged by the Orlesian Chantry against blasphemous non-believers. Now, to give the Chantry some credit, they don't just go waging war on people simply for not believing in the Maker. In fact, most of the Exalted Marches uh, have been waged against Devinter, who do worship the Maker, just not in the way the Orlesians want them to. So the first Exalted March was called by Andraste, prophetess of the Maker and founder of the Chantry. The march was against the Tevinter Imperium, for many reasons, mostly because they enslaved her and she was really pissed off about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, although actually there are some codex entries that state the only reason Andraste and the others went north was because they were being pushed there by Darkspawn. And that's why they went north to Tevinter, and it's not because they were trying to bring down the Tevinter Imperium, so that one's kind of interesting. And the first blight did happen sort of around the same time, because the first blight had vastly weakened the Tevinter Imperium, which is what left it kind of open for Andraste to uh, attack. Um, although she had been enslaved by Tevint. Anyway, yes, the most common version of the story presented in Dragon Age is that Andraste rallied the tribes of Southern Thedas, joined forces with uh, slaves and elves rebelling against the Imperium, and marched north on Minrathus, the seat of the Imperium. Yes, but it's the second Exalted March that we're interested in. So the second Exalted March didn't happen until about 300 years later, and it was against the elves, the very ones who had fought alongside Andraste in the first march. Well, not the same ones, because they had presumably died by that point, but their descendants. So, after being freed from the Imperium, the elves were granted the Dales, right? In what is now Orlais. Now, they lived in the Dales mostly peacefully for around 300 years, but there was tensions with the humans who lived around them from the beginning. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. One, they insisted on worshipping their own gods, the Evanurus. Uh, during a time when the Chantry was just getting riled up about spreading the word of the Maker. Although it's worth noting that it's not like every human was an Andrastian at this point. Like, a lot of them did have their own gods and their own religions. This is in the time of the Alamari and the various tribes. Humans themselves are quite tribal. So it's not like every human was Andrastian at this point. Uh, Emperor Draken of Orlais had been particularly vocal about stamping out all of the old religions, however. This included the old human religions. Um, you know, he wasn't it wasn't just the elves that he had to be in his bonnet about, he wanted everybody worshipping the Maker. The elves were also quite isolationist. Like, they did not want humans around. They said they didn't want any humans setting foot on their land. Part of the explanation for this is that they believed that their proximity to humans was what had made them mortal, although this is debunked by Solus later. Um, another possible explanation is that children born to elf-human pairings are always genetically human, so if elves interbreed too much with humans, they risk dying out. This is offered as an explanation by Fiona in the book The Calling as to why the elves keep themselves so separate, whether it be in Dalish tribes or in alienages. Anyway, what you basically had was the elves of the Dales who were worshipping the Evanuras and were very keen to keep humans out. And all the while, they are surrounded by a growing human empire that was insistent on spreading its newfound relation. Like, it was never going to end well, one way or another. In Inquisition, it is revealed that the elves attacked first. They attacked the human village of Red Crossing. Then they captured uh, the city of Montsimard, and it was only when they began marching on Val Royaux that Divine Renata I ordered an exalted march. Interestingly, it's the only exalted march in Dragon Age lore where no other nations answered the call. So when the Divine or orders an exalted march, she sort of like sends out the call um, to her Chantry soldiers across Thedas and says, we're ordering an exalted march, and they all answer the call. In uh, this one, no, it was only Orlesians who fought because the elves were attacking the Orlesians, they weren't attacking anybody else. It was almost less of an exalted march and more of a kind of Orle versus the elves kind of situation. Now, before all of the elven supporters start jumping down my throat, I am not saying that the elves were not provoked. They did attack first, but I have no doubt that they were provoked. 
We know that the Chantry was sending emissaries to harass them for, you know, a good 300 years. And they were also sending Templars who presumably might have kidnapped some mage elves and taken them to live in circles. I don't know that for certain, but I assume that's what Templars do. So, you know. Uh, we also know that Olay was keen to expand their empire eastwards and may actually have been, like, deliberately trying to provoke the elves into attacking just so that they had an excuse to go to war. Like, just so they could get their hands on the land. That might have been it. They might just have wanted the land. Uh, what we also know is that the elves refused to aid nearby human towns during the Second Blight. Uh, and they were very keen to keep humans out. They were just like, yeah, we don't want any human to ever set foot on our land. So, like, I don't know. I don't think either side comes out of this looking particularly good, to be honest. I don't think either of them handled the situation well. And I think one way or another it was always going to descend into war. I don't think it actually really matters that much who sort of attacked first. I think it was just always destined to happen. Anyway, the elves were eventually defeated and their lands were taken. Uh, left homeless and defenceless, Divine Renata ordered human cities to take in the elven refugees and to build alienages to house them. The condition for this, however, was that they had to convert to the Andrastian faith if they wanted to live in the human cities. And those who refused became the Dalish, and that's how we ended up with, uh, yes, the city elves and the Dalish elves. Which may explain why the Dalish have such contempt for the city elves, because they're the ones who sort of turned their back on the old gods and embrace the Andrastian faith just so that they could get a roof over their head, really. But, uh, yes, anyway. The next exalted march was against Starkhaven, interestingly enough, to reclaim it from Tevinter, because uh, Tevinter had control of Starkhaven. Uh, there were four exalted marches against Tevinter in the Black Age alone. This was after Tevinter broke from the Olesian Chantry and established their own Imperial Chantry with its own divine and whatnot. Um, both Chantries did team up briefly, though, to launch three exalted marches against the invading Canari when the, when the Canari first appeared in Thedas. Uh, these exalted marches were successful in pushing the Canari back, if not getting rid of them altogether. Indeed, Tavinta still remains at war with the Canari to this day. Uh, another interesting point, an exalted march was threatened by Divine Justinia V against the free marches during Dragon Age 2 when it appears that the Tower Mages in Kirkwall might revolt. So that would be an, an exalted march against the Mages not against, like, a particular country or a particular race or anything. Uh, it doesn't happen, however, because the the situation sort of uh, escalates faster than anybody expected and the Major Rebellion sort of kicks off before Justin can really do anything about it. So, yeah, that one never happens. I wonder if we'll see an Exalted March in the games, actually. We have, we've not seen one yet. Um, I think the... Because uh, the Canari are making moves, aren't they, in the Trespasser DLC, and presumably that'll be a thing that crops up in... God. I wonder if there'll be an exalted march against the Canary. I wonder if there'll be an exalted march against Solus. I think Solus warrants an exalted march, you know. I think ancient elven god comes back from the dead to destroy the world. That that warrants an exalted march. Like, I'd call it an exalted march against him. I think... <laughs> yeah, I want an exalted march. I want to see one. I want to see what it's like. Anyway, next. Uh, yes, the Emerald Graves and, by extension, the Emerald Knights. So, originally known as the Emerald March... The Emerald Graves is a region of Olay, though it used to belong to the Elves when they occupied the Dales, so it was originally like part of the Dales. Um, before the Exalted March against the Elves, the Dales were protected by the Emerald Knights, an order of Elven warriors. Every time an Elf took the oath to become an Emerald Knight, a tree was planted in the Emerald March, uh, sort of like to honour the oath that they were taking, making it now a densely wooded area. Uh, very beautiful as well, my favourite region actually in uh, Dragon Age Inquisition. Emerald knights feature as largely romantic figures in elven folklore, riding into battle on the backs of Halla and fighting alongside wolf companions, who, uh, yeah, were apparently very loyal to them, much like the Mabari in the Ferelden army. Uh, when an emerald knight died, they were buried in Dinan Hanin, which is a tomb in the Emerald March, now the Emerald Graves. Uh, the emerald knights were wiped out during the Second Exalted March. Um, and the region is now called the Emerald Graves because it houses their tomb, and each tree is said to represent an Emerald Knight who fell in defence of the Dales. So that's why it's called the Emerald Graves. Uh, the Emerald Graves are now occupied by Orlais and are home to several grand noble houses, though it remains largely wild and forested and home to many nasties, including wolves, bears, and quite a lot of giants. A lot of giants roaming around the Emerald Graves. Uh, yes, and it's one of the regions you can visit during Inquisition. And finally, we take a bit of a break from the Elven lore. <laughs> For Eremond. What of Magister Eremond? Do you sense a secret pain in him? No. Eremond is an asshole. <laughs> 
Well said. Yes, thank you, Cole. I think that about covers it. Right. <laughs> Is there anything more I need to say, honestly? Livius Eremond is a Tevinter Magister and a member of the Venatori cult, who we encounter during Into the Abyss, uh, which is a quest during Inquisition. Uh, he has tricked the Grey Wardens into engaging in a blood magic ritual that binds them to demons, creating a demon army that they believe they can use to storm the Deep Roads and kill the remaining archdemons so there can never be any more blights. What the Wardens don't realise is that Eremond's rituals are actually binding them to Corypheus, and he will use the demon army to... Do whatever it is that he's trying to do. Like, become a god, storm the Black City, enter the Fade. I don't bloody know. I don't think even he really knows what the hell he's doing by the end of the game, to be honest. Anyway, Eremond is taken prisoner by the Inquisition at the end of the quest, and the Inquisitor can pick one of several fates for him. These include locking him up forever, handing him over to the Grey Wardens for them to do with him as they please, executing him, or making him tranquil. Interestingly, uh, that last one, the tranquility option, is the only one he actually seems to particularly object to, which I can kind of understand. I would probably rather be executed than be made tranquil, to be honest. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our Elven episode. This was a long one, but it was good. I, I think, yeah, the Elven history is fascinating. Um, all Dragon Age history and lore is fascinating, and I think it's all connected, and I feel like... I don't know. I feel like I feel like I'm doing a jigsaw of it and I'm missing like five of the pieces and I've like almost got it, but just not quite. Like, you know, I want Veil God to give me a few more pieces. Of course what Veil God will probably do is just reveal that actually the jigsaw is like three times bigger than I think it is. <laughs> Leave me with a million more questions than answers if <laughs> if the previous Dragon Age games are anything to go by. Anyway, next time we will be covering the letter F and oh not not anything particularly important cropping up in the letter F, just, you know, Flemeth, Ferelden, the Free Marches, the Fade. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Why do I do this to myself, guys? Why do I do this to myself? Uh, just a few honourable mentions for you this time. All Eamon, all of Redcliffe. Um, Eleanor Coosland, the mother of the uh, human noble warden. And the Exalted Plains, uh, which is another sort of um, ex-territory of the Dales that used to belong to the Elves. But uh, yeah, I couldn't think of anything else. Those were the only E ones that I could think of. I'm sure there are more, but those are the only ones that occur to me. And also, thank you to Fred, because um, I've had to rope Fred into writing some of the scripts for me since we're so tight for time. So um, he did some work on the, uh, the Exalted Plains script for this particular video. I have to admit, I then went and rewrote most of it, but he, he, he put the foundations in. He put the, the, the work in. So thanks, Fred. He's become my uh, assistant script writer for this series. I'm paying him in uh, hug emojis, which I think is very reasonable. Anyway, <laughs> I shall see you tomorrow. We will tackle the letter F and we'll see how many uh, F word jokes I can get in. <laughs>